Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video is part 6 of the biography of Leonidas Polk, where I will cover his life from his command of the Department of Mississippi, Alabama, and East Louisiana to his return to the Army of Tennessee outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Please consider joining the Patreon page and purchasing a t-shirt from the Teespring store in order to help the channel grow. In the early months of 1864, Polk's new department was coming under attack quickly. General William T. Sherman was planning an invasion of Mississippi and Alabama. He would march out of his stronghold at Vicksburg and proceed east to Meridian, a vital railroad junction, then move into Alabama and its coal and iron mines in the central part of the state, where munitions and equipment was being produced for the Confederacy. Sherman assembled around 30,000 men for this task and a thousand wagons of ammunition, purposefully not bringing along much in the way of foodstuffs. He was determined to live off the land, destroying as much of Mississippi's infrastructure and agriculture as possible. On February 1st, 1864, the Blue Troops filed out of Vicksburg. Polk readied his troops, bent on allowing Sherman to march into the state in order to cut him off from Vicksburg and then surround and defeat him before he got to Meridian. Polk sent his cavalry under General Stephen D. Lee to harass the flanks of Sherman's marching columns to keep destruction from foraging to a minimum, which worked very well, but the Union juggernaut was not stopping. Polk kept pulling his men back toward the east, finally becoming too concerned for his wife and daughter's safety in Meridian, and sent them back to Asheville. Before Fanny departed, Polk asked her, Wife, have you ever thought what you would do if I should be killed, and this contest prove unsuccessful? Fanny would later recount that that was the first time that her husband had ever verbally expressed a doubt about the war's outcome. She replied that she would go to St. Anna's Asylum for the relief of destitute females and their helpless children of all religious faiths, until her children could find a way to support her. With tears in their eyes, they embraced, not knowing that that would be the last time they would see each other. As Sherman's troops approached Morton, Mississippi, Polk decided to make some kind of stand with his 21,000 Confederate infantry dug in on the outskirts of the town. They waited for Sherman's attack. Although the Confederates were able to withstand the minor assaults, they viewed the position as untenable and pulled back further. However, Polk was having to fight a two-front campaign. In his army's rear, Newton Knight, who deserted the army, had raised a band of deserters and bushwhackers that burned trestles along the railroad lines around Meridian and generally harassed Confederates. Polk had no choice but to withdraw from Mississippi. He did not have the troops capable to stop Sherman, just harass him. Sherman's troops marched into Meridian on February 14th and thoroughly dismantled the town. For five days, 10,000 men worked hard and with a will in that work of destruction with axes, crowbars, sledges, claw bars, and with fire, Sherman reported. With no one to stop them, the soldiers over several days destroyed all train tracks of the four lines passing through the town, the Mobile and Ohio, the Meridian and Jackson, the Alabama and Mississippi River, and the Southern. The damage extended for miles in four directions and constituted, said Sherman, the most complete destruction of railroads ever beheld. Cross ties were stacked in open piles, the rails balanced atop them were weighted on each end, and the whole thing was set ablaze until the steel softened and drooped. 30 to 40 degrees to the ground. The reason for the long stay by Sherman and Meridian was the hopeful link-up between his force and about 7,000 cavalry coming from Memphis, but bad weather and Nathan Bedford Force cavalry stalled them at multiple locations. Before reaching Sherman about 80 miles away in Meridian, the Union cavalry decided to head back to the safety of Memphis. Forrest took the opportunity to strike. With less than a third of the enemy force that he was attacking, Forrest chased and defeated them in multiple locations, including West Point and Okolona. Without his cavalry, Sherman could not risk an invasion of Alabama and turned back to Vicksburg. Stephen D. Lee's cavalry harassed him along the way, but the destruction of Sherman's Mississippi march had been done. According to Polk, Sherman's withdrawal had come from the bishop's generalship. He proclaimed that the brilliant and successful campaign just closed by Major General Lee and Major General Forrest was calculated to teach us a useful lesson to our enemies. They came by the thousands with glistening bayonets and confident of their strength to overrun and desolate our country, if not to strike a death blow to our cause. They had been forced to return, beaten. That statement may have been true for the Union cavalry, but Sherman's main force had not been defeated, 
as much as they had turned back for fear of extending themselves too far into enemy territory. With Sherman at bay for now, Polk went about ruling over his department with an iron fist. He divided the states and parts of the states under his control into military police subdivisions to ensure the enlistment of all young men between the ages of 17 and 50. Even the sons of wealthy planters, as well as the planters themselves, would not be spared, as had previously been done. Polk's cavalry scoured the landscape looking for deserters and shirkers, and if found, any resistance was to be met with death on the spot. A United States flag hanging from a dwelling in Smith County was met with the death of two Unionist leaders by hanging. Two teenage brothers attempting to escape conscription were killed for resisting the draft. These are just a few stories from Polk's time as commander of the department. Many more would follow in Polk's attempt to stop bushwhackers from taking over the state. Polk's Army of the Mississippi, numbering only 8,000 men at that point, receded into Alabama in early May and was ordered to join Johnston's Army of Tennessee in northern Georgia. When Polk arrived, the men of his old corps cheered his return and he was greeted warmly by many of his old Army friends. One of those to greet him was John Bell Hood, who had spent time in Atlanta with Polk. A revival was penetrating the Army of Tennessee and at one point, a line of Confederate soldiers could be seen waiting in line to be baptized in a nearby creek. Possibly overcome by religious fervor, Hood asked Polk to baptize him. The bishop was happy to do so. Hood's aide and former personal secretary to General Sam Houston, Colonel Henry Percy Brewster, described the scene. There stood the battered old hero, barely 30 years old. There the warrior Bishop Polk. And there stood your humble servant with a flaring yellow candle in one hand and a horse bucket of water in the other. To Polk's question, Dost thou renounce the devil and all his works, the vain pomp and glory of the world, with all covetous desires of the same, and the carnal desires of the flesh, so that thou wilt not follow, nor be led by them? Hood replied, I renounce them all. Polk's troops moved to Resaca and took up defensive positions. During the battle, the bishop had many close calls as Union riflemen took aim at him, but killed horses of his aides because the shots were so close. During a lull in the battle, Henry Watterson, the war correspondent and friend Polk, asked the general to have lunch with him, made up of guava jelly and bread. Watterson explained what happened next to his fiancée. While we were about to eat it, quite a brisk fire was opened on the place where we were standing. General said I, this is rather uncomfortable, suppose I look us up a cover. Do so at once, he said, and I found a pretty shade spot behind a clump of trees, where we sat down to dinner. In a little while, a shell came along and took the top off the very tree under which we were sitting, and scattering balls and branches in every direction. Ugh, says the general, you are a fine fellow for selecting safe places. I expect we'd better go back to the first principles. The defenses around Rosaka were not sufficient to hold off Sherman, and after bloody assaults against their lines, the Army of Tennessee pulled back toward Adairsville. There, in a late night ceremony, Joseph E. Johnston who had been prompted by his wife to get baptized because of Hood's impactful baptism, got baptized by Polk as well. The generals attempted to get some sleep, but were continuously roused up to answer dispatches and organize incoming troops. Through the end of May and the beginning of June, Johnston pulled back to Marietta, Georgia, where defensive preparations were made. Just in front of the Confederate defensive line was a rise about 300 feet above the surrounding terrain called Pine Mountain. Polk and Johnston placed two artillery batteries and a few units of infantry to guard the salient. From Wednesday, June 8th to Sunday, June 12th, a heavy rain fell and soaked the soldiers entrenched at Marietta. On the 12th, Bishop Polk presided over the worship service for his headquarters staff and their hosts at the farmhouse in which they were staying. By Tuesday, June 14th, the rain had left and presented a pleasant day. Pine Mountain produced a salient in the Confederate line but it also provided a great location for viewing the enemy hard at work. Polk realized that and wrote a letter asking his daughter in Asheville to promptly send him his spyglass that he had left behind on his last trip to see her. It would be invaluable at his current location. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far History will travel, he's the card of a man. Up 
Professor with knowledge in the heartland To educate the world is his mission A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian